So this is uh, Lecture 7 PowerPoint, and I'm going to call this Lesson 9 because it's the ninth uh, recording that I've made. So this particular lesson and PowerPoint lecture is on the cell cycle and segregation. So when we say segregation, we're talking about Mendel's Law of Segregation. Oh, my tablet's all crooked. Okay. And then, of course, if we're talking about the cell cycle, we're talking about the pi that's cut into fours, and we have G0, which is rest, G1, S, G2, and M phase. And then we're also talking about the checkpoints here. So the G2 checkpoint, the G1 checkpoint, and then there's an M phase checkpoint as well. All right, so this is not new. You all should know that genes are found on chromosomes, and remember chromosomes are DNA plus those proteins, histones, and together we call that chromatin. And so we have the telomere, it's the end, and we talked about telomerase, you know, adds on the DNA to the end of those and they automatically shorten every time we have replication. There is a centromere, remember meros means part, so a centromere is center part. And this is the area um, that we talked about when we were talking about cr different kinds of chromatin. And this is where the site of attachment whenever we make sister chromatids. which are identical copies that are made during S phase. And so you know that gene A in this case is going to be linked to gene B and gene B is going to be linked to gene C because they're all uh, together on one individual chromosome. So wherever this chromosome goes, these genes go together. And this isn't new. We know that the chromosome DNA plus histones, if we look at a segment of it, we're going to have a DNA double helix. You guys know that one of these strands is going to be the coding. The other one's non-coding. One's going to be <coughs> the template, and the other is going to be the non-template. We know that's made into messenger RNA. So if we have a, a T here, it's going to pair with A and mRNA, right? So... I might ask you on the test which of these is coding, which of these is non-coding. This is the coding strand because it's exactly the same code as the messenger RNA, with the exception of T's become U's. And then, of course, that's going to be uh, translated into a protein. And then we have the individual amino acids. So this is the first, right? Always methionine. Um, and then there's a stop codon, and this is the last. And remember, we have to label that to amino, to carboxyl. And then, of course, we label this 5 to 3, which would make this 5 to 3 because it's coding. And then this would be 5 to 3 in this direction because this is the template strain. Okay. So, hopefully that's just a review. Um, every organism or species has a specific number of chromosomes. We designate that number N. So in our case, we have N equals 23 in humans. And so 2N, right, when you have the chromosome sets from your, and those are homologous chromosomes. So homologous chromosomes mean, like, they have the same number right so we have chromosomes number one through 22 and then we have the sex chromosomes that are 23 it's either x x or xy um so let's say that this is chromosome number one so you get one allele from your mother and one allele from your father and maybe this codes for you know this isn't there's lots of genes involved in eye color but let's just play eye color and so this might be uh, brown and this might be green or something like that um, so anyway uh, 
this is what we're talking about. So this this would be the 2N number because there's two copies of each of the chromosomes and that would equal twice. 2 times N is 2 times 23 which is 46. Right, so in this case this chromosome would be number one and it would have a homologous pair. This chromosome would be number two and this chromosome would be number three. So in this case, N would be three and then if it's if it's uh, diploid, then it would be two N equals six. Each chromosome has a distinct set of genes and spe specific locations. What do we call those locations? What's this location here? It's called the locus. And we already covered that. Okay, so most organisms are diploid. Uh, that means that they're a two end set and they have two homologous copies, right? Like just what we said. So this would be like mom and this would be dad. And this might be, you know, brown and this might be green if it's eye color. And this might be uh your hair is blonde and this could be um black or whatever or red it doesn't matter so these are homologous chromosomes and and these are going to get copied uh during s phase and they're going to be exactly identical so when they'll be attached through the centromere and if this one is blonde, this is going to get copied as blonde, right? So when they're exact duplicates after they leave S phase, they're called sister chromatids. And they leave the cell cycle attached at the centromere. That's why chromosome, since you can't see chromosomes unless they've entered M phase, that's why they always look like that characteristic S shape because they're actually sister chromatids. This would be like mom, this would be like dad, and then they're attached in the center point, the centromeros uh, center part. All right. So this is a normal 2n, and so 2n, since n is 3, 2n would be 2 times 3, which equals 6. So that would be its full uh, chromosome set. All right. So this is this is nothing new. A gene can have more than one form. We call that an allele, right? So remember, the gene is generally the phenotype. So you could it could be like eye color, or hair color, or you know I'm I'm really dumbing this down, but it could be like height. Of course, there we know there's like 23 or more genes that control height, or like skin color, or whatever. So I'm real like again, I'm just really dumbing this down. But there's there's more than one form of of that region of DNA, and we call that an allele. So the like if we're doing eye color, it could be blue, or it could be brown, or it could be green, or it could be hazel, or whatever. And if we're doing hair color, it could be blonde, or red, or brown, or black, or you know whatever. So anyway, that's what we're talking about here. So. This is designated allele A1 of gene A, right, whatever that might be. And then this would be allele 2 of gene A, where it might have a mutation here. And it doesn't matter if it codes for something different or the same protein. If the DNA sequence is different, then it's a different allele. And then we have allele uh, 3. And here, this definitely has uh, like an insertion into it. So this is a different form as well. So we have three different alleles here, A1, A2, and A3. And the root of the differences comes down to their sequence of DNA. This we would call wild type, right? It's generally what's found most commonly in the wild. Okay. We know this, so you could you could be a homozygous, right, for any given trait, right? So let's say that this this is homozygous, so this is brown, this is brown. This, we'll just say that this is eye color, 
this is heterozygous, right? We have big B and little b. We'll just say that this is this is also brown, but this is hair color, and then uh, heterozygous here as well. This is homozygous recessive, homozygous dominant, heterozygous, and so on and so forth. So that's that's nothing new. So remember, each parent contributes one set of homologs. Hom that means homologous chromosomes, right? So um and one set is a group so like this parent would have this from their mother that they got from their mother and this they got from their father and this they got from their mother and so on and so forth so this would be number one chromosome this could be from dad this would be the number one chromosome that was from mom and so on and so forth so when they go through um, meiosis and they're making sperm and eggs, these are going to segregate from one another or separate, right? So the chromosomes move into opposite sides of the gamete, um, and then it's it's a an end, right? So so the normal cell, the somatic cell, would be two n equals six. And then the gamete would be n equals 3. So we have half the amount of DNA, two, two n's, n equals 3, n equals 3. They come together, and 3 plus 3 is 6, so we say this is 2n equals 6. And this is the fertilized egg we call a zygote. Yeah, this is all. This should all be reviewed. So haploid number is n. Um, that's the whole single homologous set. Um, ga each gamete is haploid, so it's the, it's an n value, just like I said. And zygotes are diploid, so they're two n's. <coughs> In humans, the haploid number is twenty three. So n equals twenty three. Two n equals forty six. We already talked about that, so it's nothing new. This these are homologous, right? Chromosomes, uh, we call them uh, heterologous or heterologs if they're different. So if we're comparing number two and number three chromosomes, those are heterologs. Whereas we're comparing chromosome number one from mom, and, so that's dad, and chromosome number one from dad, which is this is mom. Then we compare those two and we, we're going to get a similar banding pattern. This is going to be a different banding pattern. And then this technique is called fish. I don't think I'm asking you about this, but it's fluorescent in situ hybridization. So you can stain these chromosomes and get a banding pattern. They don't come out this way, right? They're digitally moved. So this is called a karyotype. Um, and when you're doing a karyotype, basically you take a cell and you're squishing the chromosomes and then you're segregating them out to make sure that there's a homologous pair for each one of the numbered chromosomes and they um, fun fact that they numbered them from biggest to smallest based on not on DNA sequence but based on the size that they perceived looking through the microscope <coughs> and so one is the longest and 22 uh, is the shortest but when we sequenced the DNA, we found out that this is not the shortest, it's the second shortest. And instead of changing 21 to be 22, they just kept the numbering system the same. So this, number 21, is the shortest chromosome um, by letters A, G, C, T. All right. So here's the cell cycle. We drew this a lot in the last thing. Um, make sure that you know this for the test so we have g0 which is rest most cells are in rest um, you can coax cells to come out of rest so like if you're grown and you look at your liver your liver cells are at g0 they should be if they're not then you probably have liver cancer but you could donate your liver to somebody and so in a liver donation what they do is they don't take your whole liver out they cut it in half they give one to the to the recipient and then the donor keeps the other half and so once that uh, incision is done and it's cut in half 
They don't, you don't have to live with half a liver. It, it goes from rest phase through the cell cycle until a brand new liver is generated for both the donor and the recipient. Um, so the process of going through this, um, and then in this case we would call M is, would be mitosis, right? Cause we're making, uh, somatic cells, body cells, not gametes. All right. So G0 would be coaxed out. It would go through G1. There would be a checkpoint here to make sure that there's enough nutrients and everything to go past the G1 checkpoint. And then once it was determined uh, through G1 that there's it's all good, it would go to S phase. And S phase stands for synthesis. And this is where the DNA is replicated. So we, we've talked about this ad nauseum, um, how DNA replication works. So you should know that. Once it comes out of here, uh, there's a checkpoint, a G2 checkpoint, to make sure that the DNA is copied correctly. So is the DNA correct? Are there mutations in it? Has it been able to repair them? You know, all the things we talked about in the last lectures, uh, thymine dimers, tautomeric shifts, uh, you know, DNA intercalation dyes, all of those things could introduce mutations, and it, can they be repaired? If they can, then it holds it up until repairs are made, and allows it to go through. If it can't, then the the G2 checkpoint proteins and enzymes send it to do apoptosis. And the idea is that if if it's too messed up, we don't want to pass on those mutations to every single daughter cell. So it's better to just kill itself and be done with it than to pass on all of those mutations to all of the cells that come from this cell cycle. All right, so so anyway, and then in during G2, there's a lot of preparation for mitosis, and then we have actual cell division. So that's divided into four, uh, five phases, right? Actually, four, and then cytokinesis is the actual division. Some books talk about prophase and metaphase as having an intermediary in between here, and we call that pro-metaphase. It seems to be more of the trend these days to have a pro-metaphase in there. So traditionally there's four phases and then cytokinesis, but a lot of books are going to have five. And so I'm just going to do the same. Okay, so interphase. Let me go back. So we have the whole cell cycle. Interphase is everything but emphase. So this whole area g1 s and g2 all of that is considered interface and you cannot see the chromosomes during interface they're too relaxed and spread out and then also water doesn't help because water can dissolve anything with a charge and dna has a negative charge because of the phosphate backbone so you can only see the chromosomes in m phase not interphase so when we say interphase uh, those are chromosomes that are uncondensed. You cannot see them. It looks just like this, right? There's, there's no distinguish, distinguishing one chromosome from another. <coughs> In G1, chromosomes have not replicated, right? So if we're doing the cell cycle and we're saying that, you know, G1, the, the 2N equals uh, 46. So here we're going to have... Um, 92 at the end of that and then we're going to end up with two two n cells equals 46 at the end of mitosis right so remember mitosis's job is to make identical body cells so they're they're exactly identical to one another they're not uh, any different, a, a lung cell would produce a lung cell and so on. And then we have meiosis, and this would be 2N for humans, so 2N equals 46. So the goal is to, to have a cell that comes out with 2N equals 46, actually two of those that are 2N equals 46. Meiosis's job is to make uh, very different gametes. And we need to make those N as opposed to 2N because when two N's come together, we have the normal somatic body cells. 
All right. So there are things called centrosomes. These are now being called microtubule organizing centers. So basically, this is where the microtubules are built, and eventually they're going to attach to the kinetic cores of the chromosomes. Um, the nucleus is still intact, so this is G1 phase. The nucleolus is the dark patch that you can see in, in the nucleus, and that's, that's the area of ribosomal RNA being expressed, so that's why it looks dark. And then we have the chromosomes. They're shown condensed for clarity, right, but you wouldn't be able to see these at all, so... S phase, we have the replication. So here, these are um, individual chromosomes. So this would be like 2N equals 4, right? This is this is one from mom. This is one from dad. We'll just call the red ones number one chromosomes, right? And there's two of them, one from mom and one from dad. And then we'll call the green ones number two chromosomes. So this is 2n equals 4. That would mean n would equal 2, right? Everybody can do math. Just divide this um, out. S phase, uh, the chromosomes replicate. So here we have identical chromosomes. So again, we're still, this is, we're just, we said red is number one. So it's copied in S phase, and so they're held together by the centromere, which is shown here. And so these are called sister chromatids because they are identical copies of one another. The nucleus is still intact. The nucleolus is still visible. We're still getting gene expression. Ribosomal RNA is being made. Again, the chromosomes are not condensed in S phase so you can just it's just showing you that you can see them here the centrosome is still together there's there's two of them in the cell it actually um, these divide uh, during the cell cycle as well so there's one and now there's two okay so this is after S phase and it's condensed, so that's why you can see it. So these are sister chromatids. They're joined by centromeres, right? Sister chromatids. Uh, we call these, also call these dyads because there's two of them, right? All right, so it's important that you know the difference between sister chromatids and homologous chromosomes, right? So sister chromatids are identical copies. So let's just say we have a number one chromosome. This is dad, right? And let's say this is blonde hair, dad. And this is mom. And let's say that the, her gene is uh, red hair. Okay, so these are homologous, right? They're both number one chromosomes. They both have the loci for hair color on it. Um, Now, during S phase, this is going to get copied, right? And it's going to be held together by a centromere. And that copy is also going to be blonde, right? Because they're identical. And these are called dyads or sister chromatids or dyads. And then again, same here, right? So this will get replicated in S phase. And if that one's red, then this one is also going to be red because they're identical. So these are also sister chromatids. Um, so this is kind of a wordy thing, but it just homologous chromosomes are alternate versions of a chromosome, right? Like we just said, this one has blonde. There's lots of other genes in here. So it could have blue eyes and this is green eyes and you know, this could have dark skin and light skin or whatever. You know, there's there's a roughly a thousand genes on every chromosome. Um, so re remember, they're not identical. They have the same genes, right? That means they this one codes number one chromosome is going to have the alleles, the loci for the gene that makes uh, hair color. But the alleles could be different. All right. Sister chromatids are identical copies and they're joined together with the centromere.
which I forgot to do on here, but there you go. Now you have your centimeter on both. All right, so if the cell goes through the whole cell cycle, and I'll draw it again, you should practice drawing this. I've drawn this so many times, like, I know this by heart. So put a checkpoint there, put a checkpoint here, put the M phase, put the checkpoint in the middle. And so now we're going to go through the different phases. So pro phase is the first one. Pro means first or before. Um, so this is the first phase. So the centrosomes duplicate here, right? So here's a duplication event. And they're going to start moving to opposite sides of the cell, right? This is to set up force. So think about it this way. If you had a marker with a cap on it, would you be able to take that off? If you didn't have an opposing force in the opposite direction, you can go ahead and try it. And the answer is no. So in the end, these centrosomes are going to move apart because they're going to pull this uh, sister chromatid to one side and this sister chromatid to another. And they're going to do this for every one of these sister chromatids. So in the end, um, these are all two in, right? Um, Anyway, so this region is called the spindle. It's made out of microtubules. And hopefully that's a review, but micro, microtubules are made of tubulin, and those are cytoskeletal components of the cell. Um, again, we call these sister chromatids dyads. Same thing, just like money and moolah are the same thing. Or cash and dinero, whatever you want to say it. And then kinetic cores on the outside. So if we have our cell, right, and let's say this is dad's, and it went through S phase, so I can't remember what dad is, but let's just say dad's blunt. So he's his uh, copy, sister chromatin is also going to be blonde, held together by a centromere. Here on the opposite side is a kinetic core, right? Kineticos is moving. So this is the site of attachment of these microtubules that are coming out from these centrosomes. So we have a centrosome here, centrosome here. It's building microtubules made out of tubulin. Tubulin is a protein and it works just like a Lego set. So you can just interlock these pieces together and build them out. And when they reach the kineticore, they're going to attach. Um, and that's the site of attachment uh, for the microtubules from the centrosomes okay so let's see what am i missing here uh, so in prophase some of the major events is the chromosomes condense and you can see them so if you're looking at a cell and i'll play you a video of the cell cycle but if you're looking at a cell you can actually see the chromosomes condense the nucleus is still intact right and that's an issue because the centrosomes can't access the the sister chromatids to bind to the kinetic cores with the nucleus in the way. So that's a major issue in this phase. So the next phase is metaphase. A lot of stuff is, is so when we have pro metaphase, in pro metaphase, the nucleus comes apart. And so that gains access. So they're kind of skipped, they just skipped a big chunk of stuff here. But this is, uh, uh, the nucleus comes apart, right? And that allows access of the microtubules and they're going to attach <coughs> to the kinetic cores. So there's two kinds of microtubules. We have kinetic core microtubules. And then we have uh, not just kinetic core microtubules. And so the ones that don't attach, like, for example, this one is not attached. So the ones that don't attach um, are called non-kinetic core microtubules. The ones that attached are called the kinetic core microtubules. Again, we have the spindle. The centrosomes are well on each side of the cell so that they can push and pull on these to separate them. <coughs> and... This pushing and pulling goes on until all of the cells line up on this invisible plane we call the metaphase plate. 
Okay, it's not a real play, but we'll go through that <clears throat> whenever I show you an actual um, mitosis under the microscope. All right, so now we've gone through prophase, metaphase, anaphase. So ana means up, and these things take on a characteristic V shape. Think about it like a string. If you grabbed a string and pulled it through a pool, remember the cytoplasm is like a like a pool of water. You pulled it through the pool. Well, I guess this would be in this direction. It would take on this characteristic V shape. So you can always tell anaphase by the shape of the, these chromosomes. You can see that they're V shaped here. And basically, <coughs> basically in anaphase, the chromatids separate. So there is a series of proteins that are produced that basically dissolve the centromere is gone um, the kinetochores are all attached and there's an M phase checkpoint that will hold that up until they're all attached and then the there's a couple options here. One is that the chromosomes could get pulled in. The other one is that they're pulling in themselves. So you can kind of, the way that they figured this out is you can kind of think about it as like a skier in a boat. So this is my terrible boat. And let's say we have our ski line here and here's our skier. <clears throat> my stick figure skier. And so let's say that we put a mark on this rope. Right, so if this ski, if the if the skier wanted to come into the boat, and it was pulling itself, this line would never move. Right, they would just continue past that line and into the boat. Does that make sense? But if someone is in the boat pulling them in, this line, this mark, would go towards the boat. So the question is, does the mark stay, or does it move? And so in this case, it wouldn't. This is like the boat. So does it? If I put a mark here, does that mark go towards the centrosomes, or does it stay in that position? And it turns out that it stays. So in essence, these um, chromatids are pulling themselves to opposite sides of the cell. Telo is end, right? Like telomere, telomeros, end part. So this is the end phase. The chromosomes start to decondense so that the genes can be read again. The nuclear envelope reforms, right? So it's kind of the artist is showing you that this is reforming. This would be outside of the nucleus, right? The centrosomes would be outside of the nucleus. So let me just redraw that so that those are out. These are in, right? And then the cell basically goes back to normal. So during telophase, you start getting this cleavage furrow. This is another cytoskeletal component called actin, which is the same thing that uh, drives your muscles. So it's the filaments between myosin, which is the motor protein. And this, this is actin. So this is another cytoskeletal component that's... Um, kind of like tubulin where it's like little parts and they're linked together like Lego bricks. But but think about it this way. So like if you're going to try to uh, split apart a piece of clay, if you wrap some dental floss around it and pulled it tightly, it would split into two. So eventually, essentially this is what's going on here. We have myosin and actin. They're basically surrounding it here and they're tightening that ring so as the ring gets tighter and tighter this cleavage furrow forms on both sides and eventually it's going to pinch into two and we call that cytokinesis so this is showing you the cleavage furrow the remains of the spindle the centrosomes are outside of the nucleus here um, and again these are going to have to replicate to, because there's only one pair of them uh, and they move to these move together. The nuclear envelope is reformed, and the nucleolus is starting to reform too because now we have gene expression coming back. So the ribosomal RNA is starting to re-express. In the end of this, we end up with two daughter cells, 
that physically separate from one another. All right, so that's mitosis. And I mean, I'm just going to pull up a video of mitosis so that you can take a look at what it, this actually looks like. Okay, so um, I just looked up this video on YouTube. It's no big deal. I just did. I just looked up mitosis and microscope. So this is a, a video. I'm pretty sure that this is a xenopus, which is an African clawed frog egg, and so it it's actually undergoing mitosis to make somatic cells to make a new frog. So it's already been fertilized this is not making sex cells it's making body cells you we can see here that the nucleus is still intact right these uh, the chromosomes are condensed they look like little worms here so we're not in interphase anymore so this would be prophase and so in pro, so this is pro metaphase because you can see the nucleus has now come apart so that get grants access to of the centrosomes to bind their microtubules to the kinetochores. And then there's a lot of pushing and pulling going on to line these things up on that invisible metaphase plate. So once it gets aligned, okay, so that's metaphase. It's hard to see, like there's not an exact uh, plate, but they're kind of lined up in the middle, and so that's this would be metaphase. Once everything's attached and they're all lined up in the middle of the cell, then anaphase proceeds. So anaphase is the uncoupling of the sister chromatids. The centromeres are apart, and then remember these things basically walk to opposite sides of the cell. This, I think, is in Drosophila larva. So it's just showing you the stages. And then here's another one. Okay, so let's get through the phases here. So this one, hang on. So this phase is interphase. You can't see the chromosomes. They don't look like a bunch of worms in there. And so now we can see them condense. So this is prophase. It actually is more, probably closer to prometaphase because it looks like the nucleus is dissociated already and allowed the microtubules access. And then there's a lot of pushing and pulling going on. So this you can kind of see this metaphase plate more clearly right there. I can see that pretty well defined. So it's right here. You know, it's not a real thing. It's just a pretend. And then once everything is lined up, looks like there's a straggler chromosome. So it's going to it's going to hold this up until this gets moved in and lined up. Now it is and so now we can, we're going to have uh, anaphase. So there's anaphase. And then now you can see telophase and cytokinesis. So that was a great animation right there. On the test, I might draw phases and ask you to tell me which they are, what phase the cell is in. So you kind of just need to know what's going on during the each of the phases of uh, mitosis. Okay. All right. So the goals of mitosis and meiosis are quite different. Mitosis wants to make identical daughter cells that are 2N, right? And in humans, we will, we'll just stick with humans because that's easier. So N equals 23, so 2N is 46. That is your complete chromosome set, a full set of 23 from mom and a full set of 23 from dad. <coughs> in meiosis, we're making gametes or sex cells. So we want those to be N, right? If you were making sex cells that were 2N, and this say, this is the sperm and this is the egg, and they would fertilize, the sperm would fertilize the egg, you would end up with an organism that's 4N, 
right, which would be a tetraploid. And that's way too many chromosomes. And I think we talked a little bit about this already, but if you just have a, a 2N plus 1, which would be like trisomy number 21, which remember is the shortest, physically shortest with least the least number of genes on it, then this is Down syndrome. But if you had any other trisomy, like trisomy uh, 23, or trisomy, or I'm sorry, trisomy 22, or trisomy 19, or 17, or whatever, that would result in in either death right before birth or immediately afterwards. Like it's not survivable. So there's no way that you would be able to survive with with twice as much of the genetic material because you can't hardly survive with one single extra chromosome. So this would be not 46, but 47, right? Because 2n is 23 in humans, 2n, 2 times 23 plus 1 would be 47. So you have one extra chromosome. <clears throat> so mitosis starts with a single uh, diploid cell, right, 2n. Um, ends with two identical diploid cells. So we, we have a 2N before the cell cycle. In the end, we make two identical cells that are also 2N. Not genetically distinct, genetically identical. In meiosis, we start off in the exact same place. So we have 2N. Right, we go through the cell cycle, and we're still going to end up with two two N cells, right? But these are going to be genetically different from one another, and I'll show you why. And then you'll have another cell division, which is going to be N. So you're going to end up with four Ns, and this is these are gametes, and we want them to be genetically different. So that we have diversity so that if something catastrophic happens that some of us will survive like an ice age or hiv or something like that um so we end up with four distinct haploid cells haploid remember is n diploid is 2n 3n would be triploid 4n is tetraploid we have pentaploid uh in fact like we're going to learn about this when we look at uh talk about chromosomal abnormalities but like strawberries are 8 in because they have they're octoploid they have so much dna that requires their cells to be bigger so the store bought strawberries are octoploid and you can see how huge they are compared to a wild strawberry uh, which is actually quite small i'm gonna pull up a couple images of this And this is relatively easy to do for uh, plants. They don't really mind extra chromosomes as much as, say, animals. And so it's not a big deal to be octoploid and still be the same species. So this is um, a, an octoploid strawberry. And then this would be the normal 2N strawberry that would be a wild strawberry. So farmers basically picked the largest strawberries not knowing what they were and bred those to other strawberries and they got bigger and the reason they got bigger is because there was a, me a mistake during mitosis that caused them to have extra numbers of chromosomes which they just ignored but the cells had to get bigger and so that's why these strawberries are so huge is that they have eight times the amount of DNA as opposed to two times the amount of DNA. Now, when we, so, when we're talking about meiosis, so meiosis comes from myocytes. Those are specialized sex cells, right? They, they produce sex cells. They only produce gametes. Um, when we talk about meiosis, there's two cell divisions involved. So we talked about this, right? We have a first division, which is, occurs here. 
and then the second division which occurs here and that's how we go from 2n uh, to 4n to 2n to, to 1n all right so in meiosis we have basically the same phases we have interphase right so exactly like mitosis nothing different we have S phase exactly the same process uh, the chromosomes replicate and then we have prophase. so here's the difference right in mitosis let's say that this is dad's this is the number one chromosome so this is dad it's been replicated in S phase so it's held together with a centromere let's say that this is uh, brown we'll just call it big b so dad's copy would also be big b and then let's just say mom's chromosome is blonde so that's recessive so we'll make that little b and again it will be held together with the centromere and that be a little b so this is also the number one chromosome right same gene pattern same loci uh same alleles sister chromatids Now, the, originally it was like this, right? So there's one big B and one little B. This is in the the parental cell before S phase, right? So like to say G1, this is S. And then when we go through mitosis or M phase, then these line up, right? So remember the the centrosomes attached to the kinetic cores and there's a lot of pushing and pulling so this is how they end up lining up right they line up as sister chromatids during metaphase so this is what it would look like we would have dads sister chromatids line up and then we have moms sister chromatids lined up and then these would divide right these would go in one cell and these would go in another and remember we started with big B little b right that's the genotype this is represents the chromosomes in the parental and so in here we have big B little b right and also big B little b so they're all genetically identical they're also 2n right this is all this is 2n so that's the goal of mitosis we want them to be genetically identical now even though meiosis is, uh, goes through the same S phase and G1 and all that stuff, when we get to prophase, they, these line up as tetrads. So here they line up as dyads, right? Sister chromatids and dyads are the same. In meiosis, they don't line up like that. So here's dad. I'm going to do the same example. Big B, big B. And then here's mom, little b, little b, right? So in mitosis, these would line up in one single metaphase plate, right, as dyads. But here, when they line up, they actually cross over to one another, and they end up being looking like this. So they end up being tetrads. This is dad, this is mom, right? And so these are lined up together. And if I we had more chromosomes, like this is just number one, but if I threw in number two, that would line up as a tetrad as well. There'd be mom, sister chromatids, and dad, sister chromatids in, interlinked with one another. <coughs> And then when we had the cell division, these would move to the opposite. They would, they would, these would move as sister chromatids. Where these don't move as sister chromatids, they move as individual chromosomes, right? Because the sister, the centromere dissolves and these move apart from one another. Here, the centromeres don't uncouple. So when this moves over, they're still attached they're still sister chromatids and this side and then this one would be also sister chromatids little b little b right 
and then we would go through the process again of cell division and these would get divided in two and then the gametes would be big B right one chromosome with big B another one with big B I'm just gonna write the letters instead of writing out the chromosomes because I'm running out of space but this would be big B big B this would get separated as gametes so we could say these are being sperm and then this would also be divided into two different gametes and so we would have little b and little b over here so the difference is in mitosis they line up in metaphase as sister chromatids right here they line up as tetrads which are homologs homologous chromosomes right? and that allows it to go through to two cell divisions which allows us to make four gametes as opposed to two two n cells we make four and these are all in because they're all gametes all right. so in in prophase right these these move together right there's nothing really holding them together so what they do is they they and, and we talked about this in homologous recombination in the last chapter so they're going to homologously recombine with one another that means that d part of dad's chromosome is going to intertwine with mom let me make these different colors So that, let's say that's mom. So part of mom's chromosome is going to intertwine with dad. And part of dad's chromosome is going to intertwine with mom. Right? And that allows these to move as tetrads. So they're being held together by this homologous recombination event. Um, and we call that synapses. There's lots of names for it. Like, I don't know, society has a lot of names for things that holds in high regard. So think of things that are, you know, people really enjoy or like or want to have, and then think about how many names there are. Like, so you could think about like things like sex, or you could think of th uh, things like money, and how many different words do we have for that? So same thing here. This is a really monumental event. A geneticist like salivate over this because we can use this for gene therapy if we can ever figure it out. So we call it synapsis or crossing over or homologous recombination. So all of those words mean the exact same thing, right? And what it simply means is mom and dad are intertwining their chromosomes and exchanging genetic material exactly the way that we just described it uh, during mutation in the last lecture all right so this only happens in pro phase one there is no crossing over in mitosis at all it only occurs in meiosis and it only occurs in pro phase one so i will probably ask you on the test when does synapsis or crossing over homologous recombination occur and you're going to tell me it occurs during prophase one so prophase one is the first uh divisional event and then prophase two is the second divisional event so only in prophase one does this occur all right so this is these are the dyads remember they're sister chromatids um, these are sister chromatids, these are sister chromatids. Um, these are hom homologous chromosomes here and here. Um, and then this is just showing you the crossing over events. So the place where it crosses over is called the chiasma. Um, you can have more than one crossover event in the same cro chromosome. So here we have one, two, three crossover events in this. And that's going to play a role whenever we start looking at uh, genes that are linked, things that are on the same chromosome, and we get these weird outcomes of offspring.
Okay, metaphase one is that the tetrads align in the center of the cell. No big deal. This is different in mitosis because they align as how? Dyads, sister chromatids, right? Here, they're tetrads, homologous chromosomes, two sister chromatids together. Anaphase one, so we're getting the, the sister chromatids remain together, right? They're not separated. Um, the nucleus reforms, and then, so in, in metaphase, I'm sorry, in meiosis two, meiosis two is exactly identical to mitosis. So if you know mitosis, you know meiosis two. So same thing happens, right? The, the sister chromatids are here in the nucleus. They're going to line up on the metaphase plate. So this one is <coughs> probably like chromosome number one and chromosome number two. So they're going to line up like this. Um, not as dyads, but as sister chromatids, right? And it's showing you two of them because <clears throat> we have two daughter cells from that first, from meiosis one, from that first division. Um, but again, this is metaphase, the nucleus is gone, the kinetochores are attached, everything is exactly identical to mitosis. In fact, you couldn't tell the difference between um, meiosis 2 and mitosis at all. <clears throat> Except in the end, you're going to have an N number of chromosomes instead of 2N. Same exact thing. <clears throat> All right, so in meiosis, if we have equal segregation, so members, Mendel's law of segregation is that the, and this isn't always true, but in Mendel's world, whenever he did any test, all of the traits assorted independently from one another. So they segregated, uh, the one allele segregated from the other, right? And, and this only works this doesn't work with linked genes, but we're just going to take one at a time here. So this parent uh, genetic makeup would be, let's say this is, this is mom, this is dad. This is after S phase, right? So we have sister chromatids held together with the centromere. Um, <clears throat> and then we're going to undergo anaphase. So they're going to get separated. Um, into opposite sides and then we're going to have so this is meiosis right so we're going to th these line up as tetrads <coughs> sister chromatids separate from one another and then we can end up with gametes that have very different genetic makeup right this one has little a this one has little a this one has big a this one has big a all right so that's the end of this lecture. Hopefully um, you understand segregation and the different phases of mitosis. This should totally be a review, um, but I just wanted to make sure that you know that because when we start doing uh, multiple crossing over and look at the outcome of the offspring and the gametes, um, if you don't understand mitosis and meiosis, you're going to have problems, especially meiosis. So again, um, if you have any questions, send me an email and uh, I will record the next uh, lecture on Thursday.